Yeah. Just gotta kind of pace yourself, or yeah, I have yeah. one on here. Part two of the side of work. Oh, yeah, you're the top team, but yeah, are you coming? Yeah, yeah, drop in for a few. All right. Good afternoon. Good late afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, you were in the session entitled How Dickinson Achieved Net Zero Carbon Emissions. And it, it's the end of the day. We really want to make this engaging, um, a little bit of storytelling. Uh, we've been on... Ding! <laughs> well, sorry, everyone. <laughs> Good heavens. That wasn't planned. Um, we, but seriously, we want to be able to share some of the work that we've done and make for an interactive Q&A session, um, particularly focused on the work of Dickinson, but we want to make it applicable to whatever path you are on um, in your reasons for being here. So my name is Lindsay Lyons, um, and we began, I work here at Dickinson College in the Center for Sustainability Education. Um, and we began a journey to carbon neutrality in 2007, making a commitment that took us over 14 years to reach. Um, we also achieved that goal in April, about April of 2020, while we were all in our homes, uh, quarantined in a pandemic. So we definitely were a little underwhelmed with our ability to sort of celebrate that and tell the story. And the goal of this session is really for Dickinsonians to know the path that we've traveled and um, why we made those decisions and what some of the major projects were. And then for those of you that aren't from Dickinson, we hope to inspire change where, wherever it is you come from, whatever cities you're working on, whatever institutions of higher education you might be in, or you know, we have folks from planning departments and other colleges here. So hopefully you can take some of those lessons learned. Um, We've made other commitments just besides the straight greenhouse gas emissions carbon reductions. And, you know, that's, uh, we can all sort of speak to different parts of that. You know, we have um, committed to an all college sustainability initiative. Uh, we have sustainability across the curriculum. We have faculty development programs. We have opportunities, a lot of opportunities for learning outside the classroom as well. Um, we have a college farm that we will talk about, and we really work to promote a culture of sustainability living and learning here at the college. Um, we have improved sustainability performance over these 14 years uh, through, a, through a lot of the leadership that you see here at this table in campus operations, and we're also really proud that we've done some work with our local community here um, in inspiring positive changes to combat climate action locally as well as globally. So here at Dickinson, we also very highly value our study abroad programs and send students all over the world and are trying to find the balance between um, of doing that to learn from that, but also doing it sustainably and uh, with emissions offsets and things. So. I'd like to get started by just introducing um, the panelists, the folks that I have with us here today. Oh, look who has joined, decided to join us. Let's give a round of applause for the Green Devil. Um, I'll get to them in a moment. Um, first, I'd like to start with Ken Schultes here to my left, um, Associate Vice President for Sustainability and Facilities Planning here at Dickinson. Uh, a Dickinson alum has worked for the college for 30 years or 30 mm -hmm. and um, also is, you know, kind of carries the primary responsibility of uh, setting our climate action goals and projects and, and implementing them, as well as really any sustainability project that has to do with any facility uh, on campus goes through Ken. Uh, next to Ken, we have Larry Imey, founder and managing principal of the Stonehouse Group. 
Um, they are a consulting organization that has done a lot of contract work for Dickinson College to help us with our planning, uh, project management, and, and prioritizing what we should do for sort of the greatest bang for the buck. Um, so we have Larry with us. Next, we have Matt Steinman, Energy and Livestock Projects Manager at the Dickinson College Farm. Uh, that title even limits. Matt does everything, um, but can really speak to some of the creative work that we've done on a subsection of campus with uh, our college farm. And then last but not least, um, we've invited the Green Devil just to meet you briefly. Um, the Green Devil does have a role in this journey, right? It might, it might seem silly and fun to have them here, but our journey to carbon neutrality has had a lot to do um, with pride and um, education and outreach and really sort of creating a culture and a community here on campus. So the Green Devil it has been a symbol, um, for those of you that don't know, we're the Dickinson Red Devils. Uh, that's our all-college mascot. So the Green Devil has been a way for us to sort of connect with athletics and school spirit and pride through our sustainability initiatives. And, um, you know, the mascot has been helpful in that educational effort. So Green Devil, I know you have a lot of work to do, so I'm gonna let you go. I just, yep, lots, lots to keep doing, no time, but uh, thank you for joining us today. Okay, so here's the plan for how we'll run the hour. We, we do want to make a lot of time for your questions. So our panelists won't all answer every question so that we can get through more, uh, more of your, your questions because we kind of want to know what you want to know. Um, so they each have some opening statements that will sort of describe their role in this journey and highlight some of those efforts. And then um, we will be able to take questions online, type them in the chat of the YouTube live stream. And we have some mic runners that will be able to help us um, when, we're, when we are ready for that. So I love this picture. This is just, again, sort of signifying our, our, our journey here. Old West is our signature building on campus. And you'll see this image in a lot of our literature because it really just kind of culminates the Dickinson pride and um, the efforts that we've put into carbon neutrality. And so much so, we'll come back a little bit to this, um, but the year of 2020, uh, we, we themed the entire year of the college around this effort. We gave every first year student that arrived a, a shirt that said they were in the class of carbon neutrality. We had a year long behavior change campaign, you can see there, um, where each month had a greenhouse gas emissions redu reducing behavior theme. Um, where we were hosting events, social media campaigns, and um, educational activities and events on campus around walking and biking, building a plant-rich diet, purchasing consciously, conserving electricity, reducing food waste, making commitments, and joining with others. And this, you know, really brought it did end in a global pandemic, but before that, um, it did build a lot of a lot of pride and spirit um, towards this effort. And you know, we chose these because we thought these were really accessible behaviors to our students that were in their control that actually did have carbon impacts on our campus. So that's just a little overview. And now I'm going to turn it over to Ken to kind of map out how did this happen. Okay. Well, thanks for sticking around. Um, I know it's been um, a long day with lots of great sessions, and I, I, uh, I hope our, our panel session lives up to, to the others that I've seen today. Really, really amazing. Um, so um, I was going to answer the question of my con connection to sustainability at Dickinson, and um, I thought, to tell you the truth, that I was the Green Devil, but apparently not, because he was he was over there, and we can't both be the Green Devil. So, um, so um, no, but I I actually was a student here. I graduated in '89, and for about 20 years, I was in charge of facilities management here. Um, and then about seven or eight years ago, um, I. Uh, took on my current role, which focuses more on operational sustainability of the college and advancing initiatives um, in that area, and also facilities planning. And I think it is those two things go together quite well, because um, because we need to plan for a future of of sustainability, and and so it's great to be to be sitting in that role. Um, in both roles, in the time that I've been here, I've had a real focus on efficiency. Um, so when I was 
uh, in charge of facilities management, uh, the focus on efficiency was all about saving money. So, you know, facilities management budgets are underfunded and um, basically there's not enough money to take care of our buildings, right? So if we can save money and be efficient in our, in our energy um, use and in our uh, utility consumption, then we can channel that money towards projects and that was really the name of the game. Um, and that is sustainable. But um, over time, that took on a whole different uh, meaning when we started to think about the reduction of energy to actually reduce carbon emissions. And that started here about 15 years ago uh, and um, with our climate commitment and, and, um, and so on. So um, in my current role, as Lindsay said, I've taken the lead on developing our climate action plan, working with a lot of people on campus. Uh, and implementing climate action plan projects. Um, this slide actually that you see right now uh, is sort of a way of summarizing our, cl our climate action plan mitigation strategies. I was at the uh, session last night and Carl Hausker actually had a similar slide, believe it or not, I was kind of happy about that. Uh, but because he talked about it, I'm not going to. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna kind of uh, just talk really quick about sort of more broadly how we uh, focused on our climate action plan projects. Um, we started with low-hanging fruit, and I think everybody does, but I was happy that the college actually took a stance very early on that was if you have an ROI of one year or two year, do it. Don't even ask, like just get those projects done because the savings are gonna pay for the project in, literally in the year that you would do it. So, so that was one of our big strategies and it was a great way to sort of kickstart the overall program. We also focused on big consumers on campus. Again, kind of a simple strategy, but we looked at the areas where the consumption was the highest. We did an energy audit with Larry's firm of the five highest consuming buildings. We focused on our science building, which although a Lee Gold building is a energy uh, big energy consumer um, and we focused on our chilled water plant because again making chilled water takes a lot of energy and a lot of carbon emissions are coming from that plant so we did a chilled water optimization um, study uh, of the plant um, I think I wanted to say one important facet of what we did is we channeled our utility savings into a green fund which then was used to do more projects and so in doing that we were able to um, to spend money on these projects without competing with other campus priorities, really. We weren't stealing money from other needs, and that made the overall plan much more palatable for the overall campus. Um, we tied our efforts to academics and to the college mission and to our evolving sustainability distinction, and we also tied our efforts to the eradication of deferred maintenance on, on campus, and that's been talked about in some previous panels as well. Um, and so finally, uh, I wanted to make the uh, one last point, which is that we didn't get bogged down in details when we were kind of uh, developing our climate action plan projects. And it's easy to do that because there's so many variables that are hard really to pin down when you're trying to determine what the true outcome of a uh, of a climate action plan project is, you know, how many students are on campus? What's the weather doing? Um, you know, all these, all these different things. Are people gonna turn off the lights in the buildings where you just installed LED lights or not? You know, these are real variables you really can't pinpoint. And, and if you focus on that too much, I think you can, it can lead to, it's a term Larry said the other day, which was analysis paralysis. Uh, just kind of stop you from moving forward. I think the college really did a nice job of not not getting into a situation of analysis paralysis. We did a lot of studies. We looked at things very um, in a very circumspect way, but at the end of the day, when, we, uh, when a project looked good, we were able to go for it. So I'll stop there. So. Um, Ken, I really have liked how- Oh, I didn't do slides. <laughs> It's okay. How you've taken the strategy to, we're not just doing those projects, it's very important for us that that our students, faculty, and staff know about those projects and have been involved in those projects and are learning the hows and whys of that. And I, I, mean, I think that's what makes you really unique compared to some other people in your roles across higher ed. So thank you for that. Thank you. Larry, how, what is your connection to this effort? And tell us a little bit about you. I think we've really been <clears throat> working behind the scenes uh, and in the context of this conference where we've talked about what should or could, it's nice to know what can be done. Uh, by focusing single-mindedly on a task and then broadening it to the whole campus. 
Uh, and we've not really been a part of that. We've been working behind the scenes to drive, um, to drive energy down. And um, this chart uh, is EUI. It's energy use intensity. It's the coarsest measurement of energy performance. Um, but if you can force it to go down, in general, it means that you've done a good job focusing on energy. And by combining facilities and resiliency and sustainability, deferred maintenance all in one place, you get better choices, you get better outcomes. So this is Dickinson uh, Green at 73 um, MMBTU per square foot compared to other related colleges in the Northeast. So EUI, again, a course indicator, much like um, blood oxygen level or net assets, change in net assets for an institution might indicate health. 73 indicates really good health and really good focus uh, over time. So there's uh, an example of simple focus on a simple benchmark that actually creates a cross-check on the process. Are we moving the right direction? Yes, you can make it more complicated. Yes, you need to add carbon emissions to it, but ultimately it's um, it's it, by moving it in the right direction, uh, we, do, we do better. <laughs> Part of what we've seen happen at Dickinson is uh, connecting all of these things, three things together. You don't reach good decisions if you're looking at resiliency and deferred maintenance and sustainability in separate lenses or separate departments. So watching from a distance can have the sustainability lens while he's also working on renovation projects and setting new standards for low EUI on new buildings is all part of what drives it forward. So when an institution separates these functions, I think they get to a less good place. They don't get the same sort of uh, progress. And then, um, you know, lastly, the, um, the renewables are, are uh, an important part of it. So renewables aren't, are a commodity, how you buy them, how they plug into your rate tariffs, uh, Dickinson, Dickinson did some great things with buying down the PPA by using the SREX uh, in the initial stages and then taking those SREX themselves at the, uh, at the right time when they went carbon neutral. Well, thanks for your help in this journey too, Larry. We look forward to learning more from you. How about Matt? Tell us about the Dickinson College Farm and your connection to this effort. Sure enough. Hi, folks. Uh, thanks for having me here today. So. Uh, I'm uh, one of the managers at the College Farm, and the farm is both a, a food production facility and an educational facility. Um, we have 10 acres of certified organic produce that we plant every year on our 90-acre 90, 90 farm, and in addition, we also raise grass-fed beef and lamb and a few chickens for eggs. Uh, we have several renewable energy projects at the farm. Uh, we have our campus composting on the farm, and then, uh, of course, we're an educational facility. So. Uh, classes, labs, field trips, uh, student independent studies, um, internship projects, et cetera, use the farm. Also some research projects that we have running for several years. So the farm has sustainability at its core uh, really since its founding in 2007. And um, all along we've been always trying to work towards uh, renewable energy systems wherever possible, and then energy conservation as well. So it's, um, I have some training in uh, solar energy as well as uh, making biofuels before I got here, and so I carried that mentality into the program as we were setting up the infrastructure and to this day. Um, so uh, we raise food for campus. Uh, our, um, our 10 acres of certified organic produce, about a third of that food comes to here to campus to our college dining hall. Uh, so every day we deliver to the cafeteria, especially in the fall semester. Uh, we also raise food for a uh, co-op, like what's called a community supported agriculture or co-op program. Uh, that's mostly faculty, but some students are, are part of that. Uh, and then, um, sorry, and also staff of the college that are eating that way. And then we sell at a local farmer's market. Um, so um, uh, we did a greenhouse gas, I'm gonna skip this slide so you don't have to try to squint to see those graphs, but we did a greenhouse gas inventory back in 2015. And um, what I can tell you is uh, we found that uh, we're emitting about 68 metric tons of CO2 equivalent per year. Uh, it was like a summer long study with a student and myself. Uh, and our major source of emissions was uh, livestock on the farm. About half of our emissions come from livestock. The other major components were our transportation fuel use and our electricity consumption. Uh, we mitigate that by, um, we have a substantial amount of solar at the farm. So we have eight kW of grid connected photovoltaics. We have also several 
smaller solar projects like battery powered solar for our uh, residents there. And we have uh, a solar powered electric vehicle. Uh, we also have a couple of other uh, uh, battery powered electric vehicles that we plug into the grid. Um, a major source of our, uh, our offset for the farm actually, uh, we collect uh, food waste from campus. And uh, on an average year, we collect between 100 and 120 tons of food waste from campus. Uh, so that's all of the cafeteria waste uh, every day, as well as uh, dormitory waste and then campus events. Uh, and now we're also collecting food waste from the community. So uh, we get uh, our food bank is pictured there, the, the big trailer load. Um, the green bins that you see in the picture there, we get between uh, 15 and 25 to 30 green bins per day from the cafeteria of uh, you know, food that's not being served, either um, if they make too much or it's uh, spoils or else um, uh, trimmings from the kitchen. So all that, instead of going to the landfill, is going to the college farm and creating a significant offset, mostly by offsetting uh, methane emissions from the local landfill, but also by sequestering carbon in the, in the farm soils. So I think my next picture shows that happening. Uh, so we account for about 200 metric tons equivalent of uh, CO2 uh, through the campus composting operation. Uh, in the future, we're actually working towards, uh, instead of just going to compost to uh, generate that into electricity, uh, we have a small biogas project that we've been running since 2010, where we make uh, cooking fuel for the farm. Uh, but in the, the next step of that project is to uh, create enough biogas to make electricity and have that be connected to the grid. So uh, the, the picture on the uh, side there with the cows is um, our future, and, and the one uh, with the student there is uh, our present. So, um, we, uh, we are in the, in the middle of this endeavor, and by this time next year, we should be up and running with our big digester, uh, going from food waste and cow manure to electricity, uh, and uh, pushing that back to the grid, about 200 to 300,000 kWh per year. Uh, I've got more to say, but I want to kind of leave room for plenty of talk. So. Awesome. And, and I realize, like, uh, the non-Dickinsonians in the audience, you, you may not have a, a college farm or be as fortunate as, as we are to have this land and opportunity to do this. But, you know, think of it in the biggest picture um, case study, right? We, the farm has been able to, um, to break off a section of campus that has food and student employees and learning and strategic goals. And, you know, the, the greenhouse gas inventory that you did in 2015 really helped set some, some targets and objectives for a small sector of our campus that um, has provided a lot of learning opportunities, case studies, opportunities for student learning and research, right? So, you know, even uh, people are always fascinated with the farm, don't get me wrong. But if, you know, if your connection is not that aspect of it, think about, you know, biting off that, that piece that you can conquer or, or work on within the subset of your organization that can really uh, make a difference and an impact. Um, I would like to invite online questions. We'll open up to the audience in a second, because I'm guessing you all probably have a lot of the questions that I have written here, and it would probably be more fun if you asked them. Um, but I, I do want to do two, because, Ken, I need to know this, too. I started here in 2011, uh, but we made this commitment in 2007. And can you just remind everyone of how that, how that sort of happened. How did Dickinson decide to commit to sign the president's climate commitment and, and take this huge step um, back then? Right. Um, yeah, it's a, good, it's a great question. I, I would attribute it to the fact that at the time we had, we had really the right president um, on campus kind of at the right time. So at that period of time, 2007, there was basically an energy crisis with uh, skyrocketing natural gas prices and things like that. I think our, our cost for natural gas in a year doubled in one year, literally. Um, and we had Bill Durden, President Bill Durden on campus at the time. He was an extremely uh, sustainable person. He was uh, an innovative person and an entrepreneurial person. And I think all of those things wove together caused him to, um, when he heard about the opportunity to join the climate commitment, he was like, all in. So I will never forget, I got a call in my office one day in uh, 2007, and he said, hey, um, you know about this climate commitment? I was like, yeah, I don't know about it. He's like, what do you think? Should we join? I was like, I, I, I think we should. And literally, he was like, okay, we're going to join. <laughs> and I know there's probably things behind the scenes that he was talking to people and making sure that it was more vetted than that. But honestly, he, he drove the decision. I will say, as I uh, 
think about it, though, it really was sort of a natural evolution of, um, of things we were already doing on campus. So Dickinson, I think one of the reasons that we've done uh, so well in the area of sustainability um, is that it isn't something that we just started doing in 2007 or 2009 when we did our first climate action plan. We were doing things on campus historically that were extremely sustainable well before that. So um, we've got a long-standing academic program in environmental uh, science and, and uh, studies that's been here for a very long time. Um, we've got an alarm program on campus. We've got a tree house where students live there because they want to be sustainable. That's been here since 1990. Um, we started looking at lead buildings uh, way early on. We started in 2000 when we were planning for our new science building. We've now got six lead gold buildings and one lead platinum. Um, uh, we've got a facilities department that, as I mentioned before, sort of had this uh, long-standing focus on energy uh, consumption, reducing that. So I think the culture of the campus was really very sustainable anyway, and I kind of see that this decision to, to, do, uh, to join the commitment towards carbon neutrality as being just sort of a natural evolution of what we we're already doing. So, Thanks. I mean, I think it's safe to say uh, we had a couple of these annual reports laying around, so I did put them out there. We didn't print them for you all. They were extras, um, just so everybody's clear on that. But we, um, we broke this into, uh, I really think it's embedded in how we learn, how we engage, how we live, how we operate, and how we invest. Um, we divided the, the annual report up into that, but I do think that summarizes our story. Uh, yeah. Um, so the next question is, I'd like to hear from each of you in, we've all sort of been working at this for a while. What, what is a highlight that you want to share in, in your effort or that moment where you just like, it felt, your work felt really good? Um, what was, what was that? What was that? And the order is up to you all. I'll go first. So I'm going to go really quick. So um, I could, there's a lot of things. So certainly when we, when I realized that we were going to make our, our, goal for carbon neutrality in 2020 was a huge one. But, but this is a small one, and, and it really stuck with me. It was the first time that um, our head electrician and facilities approached me um, with a uh, project uh, on campus that was really a sustainability project. It was about putting in motion detectors in a building so that we would save energy. And um, prior to that, um, I can't remember that really happening. So, um, and, and actually since then that's happened quite a bit. Like I'm approached by literally electricians or HVAC mechanics on campus saying, hey, um, why aren't we doing this? Can't we do that? We'd really like to install this. Do you, can you pay for that out of your green fund? That, that to me was a big, a big moment because if you can get the facility staff to be thinking like that and to take, take those kind of initiatives, I think, I think you're well on your way to, to making some really good progress. For me, it was the uh, understanding of balancing deferred maintenance and looking at the Rush campus, uh, which really defined a strategy. Uh, so institutions are really good at having master plans for the things above ground, but we don't always have master plans for the things below ground. And our steam lines last 100 years, so how are we going to fix them? Are we going to stay with them? Or are we just going to abandon them? Or is there something else that might work better? And studying those pieces and coming up with a thought-out underground master plan uh, made a lot of sense to us. So it really defined the future of Rush Campus and in many ways the power plant, so the symbolic nature of turning the power plant from a place that no one ever went to, to a center portion of the campus with seating area and a celebration of energy reduction rather than just energy consumption uh, really struck me as a symbolic gesture that, that recognizes the importance of energy and managing the energy in the right direction. Great. Matt? Sure. Um, I think for me it's really, um, in, I mean, there's been a lot of successes, but uh, Recently, the uh, support we're getting from various government agencies for our biogas program uh, has really been, I, I consider that a, a big win for us. Um, our biogas project started in my basement with uh, two liter bottles of sheet manure. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then we evolved to an inner tube. And then later, you know, working with uh, a student, Evan Kendall, we built a digester out of you know, rubber roofing. This was 10 years ago. Uh, and we, we put our time in, you know, really, um, 
going from just kind of tinkering around to we had some uh, really nice support from the Center for Sustainability Education, some um, student faculty research grants uh, to allow us to progress in this this work. Uh, last, I guess it's 2020, we, we, um, we won a, a grant from the EPA. Uh, it's a pretty competitive grant. And um, so to be one of 12 uh, awardees nationwide and uh, the only small college in the, in the whole country to win uh, the Anaerobic Digestion for Communities grant, which supported us because of our initiative to not just make a big digester, but also to do some research to increase food waste diversion and to do a significant amount of outreach to our community. So we're, we're seeing this as an opportunity to be a multiplier and uh, not just to do something good here at Dickinson, but also to share it with other farmers and other recycling professionals in our area. And so to have, to have um, you know, the EPA believe in us to that level that they would award the college $300,000 to do this is really, it put the, the project into high gear with momentum and really kind of no stopping us now, so. Congrats, Thanks. Matt. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so I'll invite the mic runners to, um, if there are questions in the audience, we'll just start taking those. Yeah, up there, Grace, thanks. All right, um, I am interested in hearing a little bit more about uh, sustainability um, at the cafeteria and mm -hmm. other places that food is served on campus, um, in particular, I mean, I don't expect you to have statistics off the top of your head, but about what percentage comes of produce and meat comes from the farm versus, um, you know, local areas um, versus out of state versus out of country mm -hmm. um, sources of food in the cafeteria. Yeah. I, do, can I start and then Please, you fill yeah. in? Okay. Yeah. Um, we do a lot. When we are currently the number one college in the university, college, four-year college in the United States for sustainability. The way that we get that is by filling out a reporting tool that requires like over 80 metrics. One of those metrics is how sustainable is are your dining operations and how um, the two things they're basically measuring there. So the statistics and the data that we consistently measure are how many dollars is the dining hall spending on food and beverages and how much of those dollars are spent on sustainable food and beverages. Now in the 12 years we've been doing that reporting, the definition of sustainable foods has changed a little bit. So, um, and we haven't done it in a year or two. It's a really intensive analysis. It turns out the dining hall purchases about 40,000 items. Uh, 40,000 lines in Microsoft Excel in a single year, okay? Um, so generally, um, and I'll let Matt talk about the farm aspe aspect of it, but we count sustainable foods as things that we know are grown sustainably but may not be certified. This is something like our honey that uh, comes from the guy that we know in town that doesn't use pesticides, for example. It also counts as third-party certified things that are organic or sustainable. Um, and uh, anything that we do purchase from the farm. Now, we spend, you know, we used to spend, uh, the dining budget was about $3 million, and we spent about $30,000 on the farm the last time we did a really detailed analysis of this. So dollar-wise, our dollars aren't huge. But there are some challenges to think about when the farm's produce is in its largest thing, is in the summer when no one is here, right? So we are in rural Pennsylvania in the middle of winter. So the dining hall does have, you can find it online, there's a sustainable purchasing policy that we have where we work with the vendors that we buy the food from to try and vet them as best as possible. Um, the challenge comes to cooking for 3,000 people three times a day, right? And scale and being able to have quantities of local food on a regular, regular basis. So um, we did a lot of that work pre-pandemic. And as you may know, you know, dining services have certainly been challenged through the pandemic, mostly in terms of staffing, which limits the time that they have to seek out local farmers that can produce food for us at that scale. Um, so our, our numbers are actually, you know, I think we get one out of six points on the dining scale. Um, but when you look across the, I think there's probably 800 colleges and universities that report to this, 
there's not a whole lot that do very well at that um, because of these. It, it is challenging to feed at the scale that we're feeding at sustainably. It was what it comes down to. So, Matt, I'll let you chime in about the farm food coming on campus. Great. Thank you. And thanks. for It's a great question. Um, so, yeah. So in the fall semester, when we're we're having a lot of harvest, like right now, and the students are here, we're, we're delivering every day to the cafeteria. Um, it really depends on the crop. So uh, right when you guys, when you all students get back to campus from, from the summer, uh, typically all of the tomatoes on campus are coming from the farm. Uh, all of the lettuce, all of the salad greens. Um, right now, uh, spinach, salad mix, carrots, all of that stuff is coming from the farm. So it really depends on the, on the vegetable. Uh, you know, if, if you're eating a cantaloupe uh, right now, it's out of season. So uh, it's not coming from the college farm. If you want to eat um, asparagus, that's a springtime, or, or strawberry, that's, that's those are spring crops. So we can only supply what we can grow. But what, what we do is every day we, um, or sorry, excuse me, once a week, we send an availability to list, list to the dining hall, and they will order what they need from us first. So if we have what they need and they need it, they, they will order it from us first. We have an agreement that way, and we actually design our crop plan around the dining hall's needs. So we can't supply everything. Um, with meat, we, we, um, we only butcher about five cows a year. And so uh, if the dining hall wants to serve steak, they might want to have like 100 pieces of the same steak. And we just can't get that many out of two animals. That, you know, if you take two animals to the butcher, we're going to get 20 steaks, for example. So, um, so we can't do everything. But, but they are supportive. And it's a, it's a real strong working relationship. I also like to point out that they do buy um, like apples and pears from other local farms, like the uh, Wank uh, Three Springs Fruit Farm is, is selling quite a bit of produce through through the cafeteria. Um, so, and also one other thing that's really cool is um, anytime we deliver to the to the cafeteria, uh, our packaging is completely re renewable. So we're we're delivering in um, uh, washable produce crates or uh, washable containers that they put out back and we'll, we'll take them back to the farm and, and wash them. So that's a, it's a really nice collaboration. Of course, we can always get better, but, but I do feel strongly supported by the cafeteria and that they're, they're doing, uh, doing their part, not only with the, the food, but also the food waste. It's really significant. It's a lot of work for them to handle that food waste. And so I think the CAF deserves a lot of credit for getting the food waste to the, to the curb in a way that we can process it on a daily basis. Um, one of the questions online, which ties directly to this, if you want to know more, it says, are, are our results being published in any way to inform others of our efforts and progress? Um, you can actually find that detailed food analysis that I was talking about on our ACI STARS report, which is a public document. Um, you can find it on uh, through our website or also by going to that, that organization's website. Um, it's the Association for Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education, right? That's sort of the, the body that's overseeing all colleges and universities' sustainability efforts in all arenas. Greenhouse gas emissions is a big one of those. Food is another one of those. So we actually put our report up there. Those 40,000 lines in Excel are sorted, and you can see who the local vendors are, who the sustainable vendors are what we're calling plant-based foods and what percentages, you can see that full report on there. So we do have that data and you can get it. Um, we also have an online sustainability dashboard uh, that has most of the greenhouse gas um, emissions as well as the stuff that we've done across the curriculum, courses and faculty, um, money that we've given to faculty to support this effort and a uh, number of courses that we have across the curriculum and things, as well as some of your yep. green, green infrastructure projects. Yeah, and some um, annual sustainability reports with really fantastic information is all online too. Great. Um, another question right there, yeah. Hello, yeah. It's completely okay that if if you don't know the answer, uh, I understand. Um, I know the endowment office and endowment foundations are usually separate from the actual university, uh, and I was wondering uh, what the process on, uh, you know, social responsible investing uh, for uh, Dickinson College uh, is. Yeah, is um, you're talking about investments in the endowment in the college's endowment? Yeah, um, we've done a lot of. A lot of work on that. Uh, for for many years, there was a committee of, of faculty, staff, and administration that worked together to try to make um, 
to make advancements in that area and to reduce our investments in fossil fuels. Um, I think Neil probably knows these numbers better than I do, but um, we've made we've made good progress there, but we have not fully divested. Um, you know, I think at this point, our um, what we have done is we've increased the percentage of our endowment that is invested in um, in sustainable companies and companies with good ESG um, uh, records. Um, and we've also reduced the amount of investments in the fossil fuel area, but not totally eradicated them. Um, we've tried to. Um, We've tried to do a job. So that there was a committee that worked on this. We've had um, info sessions each year, and we've we've opened it up to the whole campus for people to come and learn more about it. And I think those were well received. So I think um, we were trying to increase awareness around around this as well, and to be transparent about exactly where um, where we stand to this point with it. Um, so. Um, I guess that's that's how I would answer that one. But I think there's some good public data out there on our website also of how the college has invested in sustainability on campus, right? The fact that, like, Neil, myself, Ken, Matt, we are all, like, professional employees just on sustainability stuff in the college, um, as well as, you know, a lot of the money that our offices have been given to advance projects across the college. Uh, those dollars, when added up, I, I didn't actually realize the full scope till. I kind of look through that. And, you know, that's when we say it's sort of an all college investment. Um, a lot of I think a lot of the early efforts were going into building that campus effort. Um, but there certainly has been progress on the, the divestment and investment process as well. Um, do Matt, do we do any outreach teaching students what is in season? That's a great question. Um, I I think we do actually. The, the farm has a great website, and um, a uh, we have an education outreach coordinator. And I'm pretty darn sure that in our um, in our outreach material, we we share what's in season right now. So, uh, but if not, uh, please do. If you're here on campus, you can contact us. Uh, easy thing to remember is farm at dickinson.edu, and uh, ask us what's in season. I did want to also mention that um, student comments are always uh, well received at the dining hall, uh, whether or not they can can implement those is, um, you know, one at a time. But uh, I do encourage you, if you like, want to see more kale on the menu, we have a ton of kale in the field, for example. Let, let them know, you know, and, and uh, that helps the chefs uh, decide what to what to serve. So, um, so but yes, uh, Farm at Dickinson, you can find out what's in season if, if you can't find it online. Okay. Um, another question from the audience. Yes. In other areas of the country, students have tried to encourage their campuses to re reduce their emissions, uh, but have received pushback. Uh, do you guys have any thoughts on supporting legislation or other systemic methods that would encourage or require other universities to take on the same sustainability initiatives? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great, Larry. Thanks. So in uh, the big cities on the East Coast, we're seeing that movement, and it actually is in place. Uh, so in Carlisle, we're not regulated on emissions, but if you go to Washington or New York or Philadelphia, um, they're there, right? So in Washington, they call it BEPS. Uh, in New York, they call it the Climate Mobilization Act. Uh, and there are penalties associated with carbon that are with lack of failure to reach carbon thresholds that are real and causing institutions to plan uh, effectively for it. So when does it come to small boroughs? Um, not so sure, but places like Dickinson have clearly done it uh, on their own. One of the ways to do that, for example, is adding a carbon tax to your planning process. So if you're going to go to carbon neutrality, let's, let's, let's assign a value to the carbon uh, and begin to think about self-regulating. So um, all of these programs have had the same characteristics. They start with benchmarking, and then they move towards uh, either penalties or greater regulations. Hope that's helpful. Yeah, how about the student here? Thank you. Uh, hi, I just wanted to ask uh, quickly, what kind of outgoing, or sorry, what kind of outreach do you have to the community um, or programs that might be trying to coordinate with Carlisle more as a broad than just this, um, our campus itself? Yeah, that's a great question. You want to start? I could start there, okay. unless you want no, to. No, you start. So. 
Well, one, one big one is uh, Carlisle, uh, gosh, what, a year or more ago, probably a couple of years ago, decided to, um, that they wanted to be uh, climate neutral as well, to put together a climate action plan to reduce carbon uh, emissions and to understand their uh, GHG inventory and everything. And so the college uh, uh, really, through Neil's leadership, worked with the um, worked with students to work with the town to do, for example, the the, the greenhouse gas inventory. So Dickinson students really worked on that um, almost extensively as the first part of of the town's plan to to become more sustainable and to to uh, to. Uh, to be carbon neutral. And so that's a great example of even students doing it. I will say that a number of faculty and staff actually participated on different committees uh, in Carlisle that were working uh, on this plan to become, uh, once, you know, once the inventory was known and then we we're coming up with solutions and what are the projects that can be done to reduce emissions, a number of, of, of people in the room, including Neil and myself and Tony Underwood and others, uh, have, uh, uh, and many others at the college actually, uh, that I'm not, I'm forgetting to mention, um, worked, worked on those committees in town and are still working with them to, to do that. I think um, beyond Carlisle, the uh, county has taken on um, a uh, uh, climate action plan um, that also um, Neil has been quite instrumental in, in helping them with. And um, I, I would rather that he actually talk about that if, if, he, if he cares to, but, but I will say that's just one example of how I think the town and the college have worked together on sort of sustainability um, initiatives. But I, for one, am really proud that the town is, is starting to do this and that the college can participate um, in that process. So. And I do, I do think that's a result of the, the positive attention that we've received from this effort and also the lessons that we've learned um, and failures we've had in the processes that we've shared with others. Um, Ken's also president of the State Environmental uh, Organization for Higher Education Institutions. They just had a conference. I mean, being, top, being one of the first 10 in the nation at this and also being a small institution, ha like people call often, we present at conferences. So I, I would say that our impact and lessons learned goes beyond, I mean, definitely is felt inspirationally here in Carlisle in the county, but also to other colleges in other places. And then, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we do have a large global footprint. And we're actually making an impact at our at our global study abroad sites with our partners there who are now a little inspired by this and, you know, working to think about um, offsets for travel fees and who are they using for excursions and how are the students getting around when in country, right? So it definitely has had a ripple effect beyond just this campus. I think that's the beauty of modeling something like this, Larry, I don't know if you have anything to add, at a higher education institution is you have all these partners that you work with naturally anyway. Including the school district too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. great. Uh, Matt. Yeah, if I can jump in. Um, so the farm also has a lot of outreach. Uh, we have uh, sustainable earth education. It's an after school program for uh, middle school and, and grade school kids. Uh, we really help start the farmer's market. So the, the farmer's market in downtown Carlo um, that was founded uh, in part by Jen Halpin, the farm director, and used to be hosted here on campus before we had a good location in town. Uh, we also have a, a home gardening initiative. So the, the farm has students, and uh, Jen Halpin, again, is they're going out into the community and helping um, people that want to learn about gardening who are food insecure uh, develop gardens in their backyard. Uh, those are just a handful. We also do day camps at the farm uh, historically. So we're an outreach organ of the college and that's all for free to the community and part of our mission. So. Lindsay, it's really part of uh, tomorrow morning session, the role yeah. of higher education in framing uh, these, con leading um, these discussions. So when you really think about what happens for uh, colleges and universities, they have an obligation. There's that old saying about a uh, great city can't exist without a great college and vice versa. And I think you're seeing that um, not only here, but you're seeing it in other places. Um, Penn, for example, uh, Lehigh, for example, uh, where we're embracing and the best practices are rolling from the college into the local environment. It's very exciting. Great. Um, is there another question in the room? 
Yeah, Noah. Sorry, Grace is far away. Another area is in, um, that the town and the college are work together is to create these regional recreational trails that are in Carlisle, like including the road the, out on the street, the bike trail, but that connects to off trail uh, trails that are starting uh, start in Shippensburg and come through come through Carlisle and go all the way down to, to Mount Holly almost. So, yeah. Thanks. Go ahead. Uh, my question is, um, it, it started in 2007. I was four at that time. I'm <laughs> wondering how you've kept the longevity of this program going. At, that's, that's an impressive thing to do during the change of the politics, change of staff. I'm wondering how that process happened. Yeah. I mean, I find, it, you know, the question is how do you keep, keep at it without the burnout? Um, I mean, we probably all burned out at some point, but it's definitely... I mean, I find the energy of higher education in that there is a new population every year that comes here interested and excited, right? And this, this symposium, you got that feeling today when the room is full and people are interested in what you're doing. So I kind of like the restart every year with, with new students asking questions, um, you know, and getting excited. And the, the nice thing about having a reputation is, honestly, students, faculty, and staff, uh, it's been very positive for us. They choose to come here because of that. So... You know, when we're doing faculty searches for someone in the history department, when they are an environmental historian, the college is more attracted to them and they're more attracted to this place, which over 15 years builds a community where more people want to come to support it. Um, so that energy has always sort of like when I feel like there's nothing left to do, we just new people come and we innovate something else. So. Yeah, I would say, quite honestly, we're just getting to the fun part. I mean, I, I'm not even kidding. Like, we've, we've done the low-hanging fruit and some of the simpler stuff. I, I didn't mention our solar field, which I really should, because it, it, with that single project, we reduced our carbon emissions by 10%. But uh, all of our carbon emissions, our overall footprint, by 10%. It's a great project. But, um, you know, I, I think we're just getting to the fun stuff. We're about to install geothermal for the Alumni Center project. We, um, Matt's biodigester project, uh, he could talk about probably for hours, and it is a incredible, distinctive project. We're hoping to do a living building uh, challenge project at the farm. Uh, we're just getting into electrification. What does that mean? How do we stop burning fossil fuels on this campus altogether? It's a huge challenge, an exciting one. Um, EV, how are we going to transform our campus so that we are a campus of electric vehicles? How are we going to do that? It's a really kind of cool, fun challenge, and we got to do it. And I think we all want to do it. So there's lots of fun stuff ahead. Like, I don't feel like there's any burnout going on. So. I want to answer Noah's question a little bit, too. So um, back in 2007-8, the president of Cornell made a statement that, that sustainability could and should be the ultimate liberal art. And then Neil Weissman, who was provost here, followed up by really putting in place a blueprint that connected the, org the academic enterprise to the physical plant. And this is really the movement, in my mind, from educational education for sustainability wrapped into project-based learning that is its own sort of segment and change in higher education that really feeds this piece. And then as you, as you begin to, to roll through it even further, uh, as Ken says, there are new projects, there are new technologies, there are new challenges, and getting better is, is, is really A-OK. -okay. It's a good problem to have. I would also add, uh, just being willing to adapt, um, you know, we, when we started the farm in 2007, there was no TikTok, uh, for example. And, and the students that, that we're dealing with now are, are coming from a different place slightly than, than the students we dealt with uh, 15 years ago. So uh, you know, we're adapting as, as I get older and I can't bend over to pick up carrots as much. Thankfully, there's another generation of, of people behind me you know, on the staff at the farm. And, and so, um, the farm is growing that way. We're, we're adding new people that help bring new energy, but also we always do keep an eye on like mission creep and not, you know, we have so many good ideas that it, it's dangerous. Uh, we, can, we can burn out in that way just by, by having too many great things going on. So realizing like sometimes we have to say, okay, turn it back and, and get to what's core. So that, that happens every couple of years and we're about to do that. So. Um, I want to bring it back to the to the net zero carbon focus thing. And this is probably the I would say the least understood uh, thing I've encountered among students is really um, 
you know, so I'll ask this of you three, and this came in from the online audience as well, but we, we can do a lot to power the campus with solar. Got that. Um, you know, the challenge really comes with things that are unavoidable, right? Uh, our employees driving to work counts in our footprint, and us sending our students abroad count in our footprint. And those are two things that we, you know, you can't eliminate entirely, right? So, Ken, can you just clarify for everyone, you know, in our institution reaching net zero, what role did carbon offsets play in that to really counteract some of those unavoidable emissions that are critical to the educational mission of who we are as a residential liberal arts college? Sure. Yes. Yeah. We, uh, our, first, our first climate action plan we completed in 2009, and at that time we made the goal in 2020 to reduce on-campus emissions by 25%. Or more, and um, to reduce, and then to mitigate the remainder of our emissions with offsets. Um, and then our plan at that time went on to state that because we know that that's not the best ratio in the world: 25% on campus, 75% off. So our plan went on to have um, to reverse that ratio over time. So the plan at, in 2009 actually called to get to 50/50 by 2025, meaning. 50% reduction of on-campus emissions and only have to rely on offsets for the remainder of 50%. And then to flip it by 2030 so that we would have a reduction of on-campus emissions by 75% in 2030 and only rely on offsets uh, for the remaining 25%. And after that, we keep trying to reduce our reliance on offsets as well. Um, so we're working on that, and the question over here, like that's what also keeps making it fun. It wasn't like we got to 2020 and we we're like, okay, we did it, we're done. Not, not, not by a long shot. So we realize that um, th this is our goal over time to re reduce our reliance on on offsets. So. And, and part of that is uh, what I alluded to with the with the keeping of the central plant to feed the Rush Campus, which is on the other side of the street, is that actually keeps flexibility for other tools, whether that be renewable fuel oil or biomass plant, by keeping the system central and avoiding um, a distributed system, a decentralized system that runs solely on natural gas, you actually keep some flexibility in how to do that heat. Uh, and converting, for example, from steam to hot water is another one of those projects that Ken's going to have to wrestle with. Um, but this notion that we have to decentralize isn't always correct, and we have to electrify is another strategy that isn't necessarily counter to a centralized plant, for example. They have to, they have to work together in ways that make, that, that make sense. Yeah. I, the bad part is tw about 20% of our remaining emissions are coming out of one smokestack on campus at our central energy plant. Uh, the good news is that all 20% of our emissions are coming out of that one smokestack <laughs> yeah. because we know where to focus, right? And if we can figure that out, there's been a lot of talk actually at the conference. I've been really um, excited about it with carbon capture. I mean, maybe, maybe because so many emissions are going out of one place, if we can figure out a carbon capture solution, we're in a really good place to employ it. Like, we don't have to do carbon capture at 100 buildings. We have to do it in one smokestack. So hopefully we can get there with that technology. But um, even if we can't, we know that the plant is a huge area of focus over the next five to 10 years. We just have to figure out how to make the plant, uh, you know, a, a net zero sort of uh, system. So, um, Bill, while we're doing our closing comments, can you pull our PowerPoint up one more time? We do have. Thank you. Um, so I just I do want to give the panelists one last chance for you know you can take the the what's next or a piece of advice that you have or a closing comment for the audience. I can start. Thanks, Larry. Uh, Ken, good thing rates are up. They're going to make your ROI a little better. Uh, <laughs> isn't, isn't that helpful? It's going to give you more ammunition at the budget table. It's true. <laughs> um, it's uh, interesting that we're at a point now where, where we can build net zero energy buildings cost effectively. Managing a campus is different, but why, why do we measure, why do we build buildings on campus that aren't net zero energy? What can we do to pull down our average and do some creative things? And what are the tools we have with us uh, that can compete. Um, we know electrification is important. We know the levelized cost of electricity is down, even in Pennsylvania that doesn't have uh, great incentives. But we've got more tools. We've got more incentives. Even the IRA has, has incentives that come more directly to institutions like Dickinson, for example, right? We no longer need a PPA partner to provide tax equity. We can do it ourselves, in effect, 
and get, in effect, a lower cost of funds because we're not having to go to outside markets for financing. Um, so, so we have more tools in an environment where um, the next step is just beginning, and uh, I'm fond of Bill, Bill McDonough. He says sustainability takes forever, and that's the point. So Ken's going to be around forever. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Matt? Uh, I would say, you know, to the students in the room, um, uh, this stuff is a, is a labor of love, you know, and um, farming is not a nine-to-five job, uh, neither is sustainability. Um, a lot of the projects that, that we have have been won through blood, sweat, and tears of, of uh, you know, staying after hours and getting, getting things done. So I just encourage you when you go out into your uh, working world or, or as, um, you know, students on projects that, that you know, put your time in and, and uh, uh, don't expect it all to just happen overnight. Um, but it is, if you enjoy what you're doing, it's really rewarding. Uh, and, uh, you know, I feel very lucky that I get to work outside at least half the time. And, and so even though they're long days, they're, I get to see the sun and, and the birds and such. So pick something that you enjoy and, and work hard at it. And, and uh, ideally, it bears fruit for you. So. I guess if, if I had to real quick say, I wanted to show this picture of our solar field, but... Well, there's our solar field with our, our mowing team, which is our sheep. So that's uh, Matt brings 40 sheep out there to, to take care of the grass underneath the panels. But um, this solar field, which, took, which eradicated 10% of our uh, emissions, didn't cost us anything. It didn't cost us anything So because we did it as a PPA. And so I guess I would just say, um, honestly, um, what the college has experienced in employing these climate action plan projects is if you do it creatively, there are funding sources out there where you can get this stuff done without robbing monies from other areas of campus that, that can't afford to have money robbed from them, right? So um, you can do PPAs, you can do PPAs for almost anything at this point. There's rebates, there's grants, you might be able to get gifts, and then there's utility savings. Um, that come with these projects um, that you should be folding into that as well. So I guess money, um, while always an issue, I, I don't think it has to be um, the hugest hurdle if, you're, if we really go at this kind of creatively and think of it the right way. So I would leave it with that. Thank you to the three of you. It's such a pleasure to get to work with these three. Um, I'm very thankful to be at an institution that values this and have get to work with all of you as well. Um, my closing comment would just be that we are not perfect and you know you will walk around this campus and see unsustainable things that's going to happen anywhere that you are um, we're pretty good at a lot of things and we have we have a depth and you know I encourage all of you to those of you that see things that that bother you or if you have questions or interest in the data to continue to get involved um, that's what the Center for Sustainability Education is for to really connect you to resources on and off campus to pursue your interests and passions and sustainability. So um, because we did not get to celebrate our carbon neutrality in April 2020, as we hoped, uh, Larry uh, and the Stonehouse Group have invited everyone in the room um, to a celebratory reception that will begin just after uh, closing of this. It will, um, the information's up here on the screen. At, we're going to meet at Grand Illusion Hard Cider for some drinks and snacks. And to just continue this conversation and really celebrate the good work of, um, of everyone here at Dickinson College and bring that together. And then we invite you all tomorrow to continue this conversation. Also, Ken will be moderating a panel at 9 o'clock um, entitled Climate Action in Higher Education, which is really why are higher education institutions a great platform to really launch this work. Um, and we have some great leaders here. So... Um, thank you all for a long day, a wonderful day um, filled with passion and energy, and hopefully you can hang out and have a drink. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Well done. Thank you.